Welcome back to another edition of Songs of the Ozarks, a project of the Ozark Studies Institute, an ongoing initiative of the Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Emily Flatness, and today's date is March 14th, 2023, and our special guests today are the Finley River Boys. And we're here at the home of Bill and Brad in Springfield, Missouri. Thank you guys so much for meeting with me and letting me sit in your home with you and chat a little bit. <laughs> it's an honor for us to have you. Thanks for coming oh, by. Thank, thank you. For doing you. This really. uh, certainly. I'm very excited and excited to have a student at Missouri State participate. Go Bears. <laughs> Go Bears. But this song was uh, Phil McKinley. He lives down at Cape Bear in this front lobby. But where's Phil? Uh, Phil didn't have anything to do. It was one day when he was uh, living around Lake of the Ozarks. He came up one night and brought a bunch of music and asked us to do pick some stuff of his stuff to do. So he wrote this many years ago. <laughs>
I was there. Makes me wish that I was there. Makes me wish that I was there. originally from the Ozarks region? Go ahead, Zach. Sorry. Yeah, so I've, I've lived here my whole life. Um, grew up in Marshfield, Missouri. Went to high school in Lebanon, Missouri. So all around the area. I go to school at Missouri State now. So lived here my entire life and just really love the area, love the people, and love the music, obviously. <laughs> Gone to do a lot of, uh, grew up going to a lot of these traditional festivals, playing with a lot of these organizations, and it's just been a blast. Me? No, I'm a neighbor. I grew up in southern Illinois, so not truly Ozarks, but close. So I'm a next-door neighbor. Uh, moved to Arizona out of high school, lived there for 30 years, and then moved here after reading and hearing so much about this part of the country in 2010. So that's like, what's I gotta go? Closer to the Cardinals. Well, not closer to the Cardinals, I guess. Yeah. For the, for that reason. Okay, well, I was born in Nebraska, which I don't really claim that I was there. <laughs> I grew up in Colorado Springs, uh, went to Bible College in uh, Waxahachie, Texas, and then uh, moved to Arizona, lived there for about 25 years, and mm -hmm. then transplanted out here in the Ozarks about 12, 12 years ago, somewhere in there. So, not a native, but transplanted. You guys are national travelers. <laughs> <laughs> I have lived here all of my life. Wow. I was born here, raised here, born in Springfield, raised it, grew up at Rogersville, went to school at Rogersville. I've been here all my life. I've lived on the same patch of ground for almost 40 years. No wow. kidding. That's phenomenal. Um, so how did you all get into the genre of bluegrass music? So it I got into me. What did you, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. Because my, my musical experience started with the Beatles. Really? Yes, it did. My older sister brought home some Beatles records when I was six. And that's what flipped my musical switch. Of course, my dad was a guitar player. That I never got to see much of, but yeah, and, and then and then uh, the Beverly Hillbillies oh, with yeah. Western Earl on the Beverly Hillbillies and Foggy Mountain Breakdown with the Bonnie and Clyde movie, you know, it just the five string banjo just got me. I didn't pick it; it picked me. When did you officially start playing the banjo? I well, officially the first bluegrass band I played in was in two thousand and seven with the Missouri Mountain Gang. No kidding! Yeah. Wow. So relatively recently. Barely. I've had a banjo around all my life, but I just plunked around on it for a long, long time. Um, so did you have other ancestors that played? Mm -hmm. My father did, and um, I've heard that there's music in the family. Yeah. So. Blood's in the blood. What about you, Brad? When did I start playing bluegrass? Yeah, or how did you even get interested? Okay, we were out in Silver Dollar City. <laughs> I'll give credit where credit's due. <laughs> There's this guy tearing up a bass. <clears throat> he was slapping it, which is what I don't do with the bass. But um, I decided that I'd like to try to do that. So we went down and bought a Palatino bass. I think it was like $500. And I played it for a group called Acoustic Essays. Um, which is what really what the original name of this band was. <clears throat> wow. So I just went through a big transition. So I'll give a shout out to Millie Donahoe, who's still out there. And she's one of the originals of the band, which was Acoustic Essays. But what happened was, is um, I started playing the bass, and I played with them. I was supposed to be hired and fired the same night. And instead, they brought me on, and they brought Bill on, and then they all left. And um, well, other than Millie and Dennis, and then Dennis has passed since then. But, and then Brett came on. But I've been playing for about 11 years now, 12 years. 
yeah. somewhere in there with that. That's awesome. So. <laughs> Again, relatively recently. Yeah, that has. Yeah, I've been in music my whole life, ever since I was a little tiny kid. Really? I traveled through Bible college with the Harvesters, and then we, Bill and I both were the new men of the West for Rex Allen Jr. Um, so we toured with him, them and Lacey J. Dalton, Bix Crary, Johnny Western, all those fellas. And then we decided to move out here because of family health issues and stuff like that and being closer to family and stuff. And our jobs weren't going so good in Arizona, so here we are. Here you are. <laughs> so did you mostly identify as a singer? Yes. Um, wow. Yeah, that's definitely. Fantastic. That's what I did. Didn't play any instruments until then. I, I play a little bit of keyboards and stuff like that, but mainly that's my baby over there. That's awesome. Yeah. What about you, Bill? Yeah, so I, I grew up with country music. My mom and dad had a country band when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and I was five, six years old, and they played in bars and things on the weekends. My aunt and uncle owned a bar in Mount Vernon, Illinois. My mom and dad were the weekend entertainment, and I remember them sticking me behind the bar on a blanket to sleep while they played music all weekend long. <laughs> so it's always been there. My mom's always played and sang and played guitar. So as I got older, about eight years old, they started teaching me how to play, and so for a while, I became the gimmick. They had the little eight-year-old kid up on the stage, would come up and do a couple songs. They'd give me a bag of cheese curls and send me back behind the bar. Oh, but uh, nice. as Brad mentioned, we uh, sang back up with Rex Allen Jr. for a while in Arizona, in, uh, doing country music there, and moved back here and really started doing bluegrass uh, when we went to the first Gobs meeting. We would try to go find a place mm -hmm. and find people. And uh, they sent us down to... At the time, it was the Ozark Celebrations Festival down at MSU to look yeah. for the Gobs tent and meet people to find out where they were and get a hold of Dan O'Day, and who was the president back then, and get hooked up with Gobs. And then that's how we started playing bluegrass here, and that was in 2010. That's fantastic. Um, did Does music go way, way back in your family, you know, beyond your parents? and My family, yeah, my grandparents wow. and stuff, they would... It's the weekend thing to do. They would show up at the house, and my grandma with all her kids, and she taught them all to sing. And uh, it'd be you no know, unusual thing to come to our house on a Friday night, Saturday night, and people bring their coolers of beer and whatever else and whatever instrument, and sit out in the yard around an open fire and just play and sing until daylight. That's just how they. That's just what they did. Was the community you grew up in relatively rural? Very small. <laughs> I lived in a little town called Thompsonville, <laughs> Illinois, that had a population of like 230 people. <laughs> so it was tiny, tiny wow. town, and that was what we did for entertainment. What the about day. you, Brad? Um, did you have ancestors who played or sang? I've got family from <clears throat> on the rental side that play keyboards and stuff, and a lot of church type stuff. Yeah, you know, pastors and stuff, pastors' wives that did that kind of stuff. Um, my sister plays a little bit of guitar, sings a little bit, but beyond that, my immediate family. No. Just me. Wow. And so I, I guess I was the one out of the, the group. So Yeah, a little a little anomaly. <laughs> the wild hair, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> much like much like Brett over here. Yeah, what about you, Brett? Yeah, so um, I actually started playing when I was four years old. Um, I can say this now. I, I used to get embarrassed by it, but I was a huge fan of like Barney, the big purple oh, yes. And uh, <laughs> there was an episode where he was like it was like a lesser <laughs> episode and he was playing fiddle and I was like, I wanna do that. So I went to mom and dad and asked for a, a little like quarter inch fiddle and uh, um, looking for a place to give lessons and really nowhere in the area would teach a four year old. So we went over to uh, Buffalo and eventually found Russ Weeks, um, who is you know one of my best friends, love him to death, and uh, he started me that day or not that day, but he started me you know pretty quickly and uh, I was with him for a very long time. And then um, so yeah, I was my fiddle teacher. I learned about everything I know from him. He's a great guy. And um, learned a lot of the kind of traditional Ozark fiddle playing, I guess you could say, just more traditional like fiddle type songs. Um, would play some country stuff every now and then. Um, Russ is actually a great guitar player as well, so a lot of times we would go play like a little 30 minute hour show somewhere in there, just kind of a place that's just fiddle and guitar, mainly fiddle music, a couple of like vocal songs thrown in, but I was pretty little, so mainly just fiddle stuff, and uh, met, you know, these guys, and uh, ever since then been playing bluegrass, but just kind of kind of just gradually morphed into the bluegrass. It wasn't really anything major, just kind of grew up playing the traditional fiddle music and kind of yeah. went into bluegrass. My favorite story about that, only I tell on him every now and then, is he was, imagine, he's a four-year-old little guy, right? And Russ is his brand-new fiddle teacher. And Russ hands him the fiddle and shows him how to hold it and put it under his chin and where to place the bow and stuff, right? So Brett had done this four years old, remember? And he puts the fiddle under there and he starts looking around the room. He looks at Russ, he says, 
where's the stage? <laughs> <laughs> and he's been on one ever since. Yeah. <laughs> and you do a lot of, you know, um, what would you categorize it as? Classical solo music? Um, choral music? Yeah, yeah. Um, not not really on film. I, I've never really done much violin. Like, I played around with it, like... I think we we've done like canon for we for weddings and I played um you know songs with choirs stuff like that but I do really love choral music um I got to do it all throughout high school went to competitions and we actually met a lot of times at the yeah. competitions with choirs so um, really love getting to do that did some in college just um you know last year just scheduling all that kind of fun stuff but um yeah I did a lot of the choral music and so that was a lot of fun and uh, growing up going to, got to play with a bunch of other fiddle players uh, back then it was called the Possum Holler Fiddlers. Loved it to death. Met a lot of um, other young fiddle players. Now it's just called the Ozark Mountain Music Organization. So definitely look them up. They're great. If you have any kids just like that, want to learn how to play, they're fantastic. They've um, when I joined them, it was just solely basically fiddle. They did like a little bit of guitar, but mainly fiddle. Now I think they do just about every kind of bluegrass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how that organization has grown. Helping kiddos like That's you, awesome. you're a yeah. great example of. <laughs> exactly. I was nine years old my first fiddle camp, and it was wow. it was great. And, it, to see it grow now, it's just, it's really cool. Tell me a little bit about um, the music festivals that you guys go to, like Starby Creek you mentioned, um, any of the other festivals around Goodness, we've here. Done, we've been to Simba several times. We do the state fair, I think for the past five years, oh, anywhere between three and five days for that, or three and four days, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Rosing, Kentucky, down at Jerusalem's Ridge. We've been there several, several times, and we'll be there again this year. Oh, awesome. Um, we do Attila, uh, their Heritage Festival Alabama. in Alabama. Wow. Uh, so we do Kentucky, Alabama, Minnesota, Uncle uh, Indiana. Uncle this year Uncle at Bean Blossom. Blossom. Yeah. Oh, that's I absolutely neat. love getting to travel and go to all these different kinds of states, but it just really, it's really happy when you get to do a lot of these like local festivals as mm -hmm. well. Like you mentioned, in Starby Creek. Um, there's a lot of like you know like one or two day festivals that we get to do. We just we really love getting to do that because um, you know a lot of them started kind of dying out for a while. So kind of seeing interest kind of pop up with that kind of stuff again, and started seeing crowds full and that kind of stuff. It, it's really great. That's awesome. It's like what five or six years in a row out at Carl Junction, which is a pretty big local yeah. festival. Yeah, that's a great. It's almost every year at Seymour at the Apple Festival, Versailles at the Apple Festival. All the, all the festivals around here locally. All yeah. festivals of every kind of fruit. Like <laughs> right? Yeah. And then there's the broiler fest. Have yeah, you ever broiler, played yeah. it? No, we haven't the broiler fest out there. Oh my goodness. I've actually been there Bucket with the Possum awesome Poly Fiddlers. We oh, played there fun. one time, yeah. Um, yeah, so if we can put a shameful plug, if you're on Facebook and you, if you go to Finley River Boys, like our page, you can look at us at, at YouTube. Uh, Finley River Boys is there. Um, all, every kind of social, basically. All kinds of social awesome. media, yeah. So give us a like. Come on out to one of our shows. We'd love to meet y'all, too. I didn't even register shameful plug at first. I love <laughs> shameful plug. I love that. <laughs> um, so do you see a big difference whenever you guys travel to other regions like Alabama and Kentucky? Do you see a big difference in maybe the reception to your music or the crowds, um, the kind of folks who attend those festivals? I, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so the receptions are always great no matter where we go because people that go to those festivals, they go there for the music. Mm. They love that music. We love uh, find that they love hearing songs and things that they're familiar with and sing along. So we'll throw some original stuff in there as well just to you know put our take on things. But people really enjoy the old stuff that they're used to, the traditional things that they're used to hearing. But the receptions have been great. Uh, another shameful plug, if you will, though, <laughs> to, to encourage people to attend and go to these festivals, mm -hmm. even the local ones, as Brad mentioned. Yeah. They're dying out. There aren't as many as there used to be, and attendance is really down. We're, bluegrass is perceived as an older generation type of music, but as you all talk about the Ozark Mountain Music Association and Possum Holler Fiddle, there's lots of younger people like you and your band that are playing bluegrass music, and if younger people don't do it, it's going to continue dying out. Mm -hmm. So I tell folks all the time, give your kids an instrument, teach them music, teach them how to sing or play, buy them an Xbox, sure, they can do that for a few years, but music you can have whether you're 8 or 80. So, yeah, I Support your local musicians. That's please. right, yeah. absolutely. I always do whenever we typically go to these, because uh, like all, every region has their own different kind of style of bluegrass. So like whenever mm -hmm. we go to Rosie, Kentucky, it's going to be a lot more of the very traditional Bill Monroe style. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, other places as well have different kind of styles. So it is it is fun whenever we get to go to other states to kind of show them kind of what a more Ozarky 
kind of bluegrassy sounds yeah. like and stuff. Especially like with if when we do kind of fiddle music, because I typically do a lot more of the kind of more traditional music style of fiddle music. So that's always a lot of fun to get to do, and just to kind of um, so we like to do songs like Ozark Hills and stuff like that. Kind of gets to showcase where we're from. Yeah, it seems like you guys have done a lot of songs that are by you know local songwriters. Yeah, really. In, in we're, we're very humble and very uh, fortunate on many of the places that we've got to go. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of bluegrass bands out there that would like to go to places mm -hmm. where we've gotten to, and God bless them. I, I hope they all get to make it you know, every place that they want to on their wish list. We've been real fortunate, and our bucket list is getting smaller, so it's really nice to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But we've had so many you know, singer-songwriters that have also submitted stuff to us that we're very humbled that they would be... Yeah. ask us to you know perform some of their stuff and a couple of the songs that you have there on your recording were some musicians that came up and just asked us if we'd mind listening and recording a, a song of theirs and we have quite a list you know on the computer too of people that have s submitted stuff and we're very humble for people to do that i mean it's it, it means a lot for them to come up to us because we're just a regular bluegrass band out there just doing what we enjoy mm -hmm. you know there's nothing special about us you know amongst anybody else we just enjoy what we do and there's lots of folks there's emails almost every day people submitting stuff and here's a song i wrote give a listen tell us what you think if you want to yeah. use it or please feel free and i bet there's a hundred in there of emails that people have sent over the last few years to listen to so what kind of songs do you guys look for whenever you're choosing Songs that have a lot of meaning, mm -hmm. songs that have, usually you can tap your foot to some. Um, but a lot of songs that are from the heart. I mean, if they're from the heart, including gospel or just regular bluegrass. I know we talk about, you know, a lot of the bluegrass is, talks about murder and mayhem <laughs> and all that. But really? there's also a lot of bluegrass out there that's just really fantastic and heartwarming music too. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's really cool too, I think that we're kind of blessed to get to have is like a... We, some of us have kind of different tastes as well mm -hmm. and what we look for in a song. So it kind of helps us kind of pick for balanced music. So like, um, I know like Brad, for instance, really loves, um, really looks up the lyrics mm -hmm. and wants to make sure that it's telling a story and that we like, you know, we, we find meaning from the story. Um, I typically look more for melody and if I like how it sounds. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that too, I think is from kind of like what I mentioned earlier with the choral. We do a lot of stuff in foreign languages, so I don't always know what we're talking about, but I'm like, I, I know what the melody is. So like. I think it's, it's really cool that we get to kind of like look for different things within songs and um, you know it's usually a great song if, if we both like it. It's just like Absolutely. he really likes the lyrics and the meaning behind it. I like the melody and uh, yeah and it, um, also most of the time people are also really fantastic about um, kind of letting us kind of take some creative like, liberties oh, yeah. with their songs as well because um, you know every well, just about every song we do we always like to kind of put our own little spin on it and so most people like I, when I say most, I mean like everybody that says this one, they're always very gracious about that. And it's like, well, we send it back to them and be like, this is kind of, you know, what we kind of did with the song. It's still okay with you and et cetera, kind of stuff like that. I think one thing that might make Danny a little bit crazy as a banjo player is <laughs> we, uh, we always look for songs. I tell people, <coughs> I look for songs that's going to connect with people, that they're going to connect mm -hmm. to us and connect with the song. And so we don't ever really have a set set list of what we're going to do for the hour, 90 minute show we're doing. We'll have a couple that we're going to start with and a couple we're going to end with in the middle. It just depends. It's whatever the crowd's reacting and responding to. We'll lean more that direction. And if we pull something that they don't respond real well to, we're on the fly. We're always thinking about why we're there, that we're there to sing for them and to entertain them, not to entertain ourselves. And so we try to sing the songs and do the things that's going to get the best response from the audience because they're why we're there. Yeah, so most of our lists we end up not even on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We yeah. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, tune that banjo. Tune that banjo. We're going to make the tune again. And, you know, it's just usually, even if we have one, it's just kind of adapting. So, like, if we're, you know, have a bunch of slow songs in an order and you notice the crowd is really liking the fast ones, we're like, okay, mix this song. And usually they're in five different keys. So, sorry yeah. about that, Danny. Yeah. Right. Well, officially, the band's been together now for 10 years. Danny's the newest kid on the block. He started in October this past year. Uh, Alan uh, retired. He has some grandkids that he wanted to take care of and hang out with them. Can't blame him at all. Okay. I talked to him weekly, at least. And he's doing really good for anybody out there asking about him, but he's doing great. And um, But the three of us have been together for about 10 years, and we have a bunch of albums. So if you need an album... Also, just look us up and shameless we'll get you a plug. CD. <laughs> <laughs> Another shameless plug, what can I say? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, tell me a little bit about how you guys met and started playing together. I'll, I'll start. Okay, we were at a gobs thing. Okay, this is how Brett, I met Brett. But um, they have this band, build a band night. Scramble. Where you put your, hand, your name in a hat or a bowl if you play bass or whatever. So Brett and I ended up in the same band. Well, we played that night and basically went our own ways. And it was about a couple months later, uh, the, the band was known as Acoustic Essays, was doing a benefit or saying at a benefit for... It was a Marshfield. Marshfield, Marshfield for Emily. It was for... What's that? Aaron Chapin. Aaron Chapin. Girl with, yeah, leukemia. Who, yeah, non-Hoskins leukemia. But uh, I walked up to Brett, and he's... Mind you, he's tiny. You know, a little tiny guy. <laughs> and he was playing there at that same thing. And I said, do you remember me? He puts on this, you know, smile like... Yeah, and I knew he didn't know me. You know, so I, I reminded him. I had no idea who you were. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, he'd come to several of our things out at the Ozark Senior Center and start playing with us. And next thing you know, is we were getting him in the group with us. And so he's been with us since he was 12. 12. Yeah, 12 years old. Yeah. So, yeah, 12, 13, somewhere right in there. But I started kind of introduced when I was 12. I think our first ever like official show together was when I was 13. Yeah, but yeah. just turned. That's so, fantastic. You can do the math. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it's pretty remarkable, you know, that a band stays together for so long and has the same members. What's your secret to... I think it's just everybody gets along. Good camaraderie. You know, he, he's a practical joker and uh, <laughs> he, he picks nonstop, which is really good. Uh, I, I think it's just everybody just gets along. Mm -hmm. I mean... If well, you have to all want the same thing and to be the yeah. same like-minded kind of people. We're, we're very family-oriented-ish, if you will. Yeah. Lots of trips and stuff. Even during the whole COVID lockdown, we had practice every Tuesday night. Even though we weren't playing anywhere and shows had shut down, we still got together, had pizza night. Or game just night. Day, or game night. Yeah, played all kinds of board games or taught Brett how to play poker and all that kind of <laughs> terrible stuff. And we tried to support our fans during that whole season by putting a, a, a new song on... Uh, Facebook every week, and we've continued that since COVID, because there's still people that are a little bit afraid to get out for, you know, yeah. whatever reasons they have, but we still continue, even though the songs aren't really polished, if we just did a rehearsal song, we'll put it out there just where people can be, still be part of us until we get to meet them back up at the festivals and the events, because that's the best part for us. We love to meet everybody. Definitely camaraderie. I know whenever, um, you know, Alan retired, we were looking for a new banjo player. We didn't tell Danny this at the time, but we were, uh, we were definitely kind of, um, not to use too, too new term, but we were kind of looking for vibes with that. Oh, so just yeah. kind of, you know, whenever we're playing together, that kind of stuff, in. uh, just kind of seeing how well we get along and, you know, if, yeah. if Danny was really rude, then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right though. It's it's because you spend so much time. You hope you spend a lot of time together, right? Because that's you know Emily. If you bands change members all the time, you don't get a real good consistent feel. Mm -hmm. I've gone to festivals to see a band play. It's like there was only two members of the band, and then three or four other people that joined in the play. I didn't really get what I was paying for. But uh, having a group of people that are consistent matters. And when we interviewed folks, and we had lots of people coming up, played with us, some really good pickers. Not so good personalities, yeah. some really good personalities, not, not so good pickers, not committed. So trying to find that person that just fit in the first night Danny was here and he left us like, okay, we're done. <laughs> we, 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 we think we have him. Plus it came pretty highly recommended by some people we really respect. Oh, that's so, great. So uh, that helped too. Go Danny! Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's not normally this quiet time, right? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm suffering from weekend lag. I just got off work. Oh. I'm <laughs> So. I understand that. It's starting to <coughs> eat. Um, so, Brad, you're really into um, horses, it seems. Used to be, yeah. Used to do Western yeah. Pleasure and that kind of stuff. And I uh, had some horses down in Utah when I was living there. And I worked for a thermal injection plant like he's doing now. And then I drove a semi for a bit. But yeah, a lot of horses and love Western Pleasure horses, you know, quarter oh, horses. Bull rider, like that too, weren't you? A long time ago, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dumb. How would you all um, sort of identify with, you know, rural living, rural ways of life? It seems like that's a big theme in a lot of your music. Um, why do you think that you kind of go in that direction? Have you had a great relationship with rural living? Well, for me, that's where I grew up. Yeah, yeah that's I where I grew up. Town, so. I don't want to live anywhere else. I don't even like coming into town, period. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
I have to, and, and if, if I didn't have to, I'd stay home. Yeah. And I think it's just quintessential Ozark. You know, that's that that's what the yeah. Ozark says. You know, we I mean we have we have we have sizable towns in the Ozark. You know, Springfield, Ozark, even you know Arkansas towns. But um, you know, that's when everyone thinks of the Ozarks, they think of the Beverly Hillbillies typically. So, right. Uh, you know, I think it's just pretty pretty consistent with that. And like, you know, I live in Springfield now um, on campus. Um, so you know, definitely not rural there, but um, grew up in a rural town. Um, you know, family always you know grew up. You know, hunting, shooting, all that fun stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. and I always came from big cities. Phoenix, Arizona, was like seven million, or it's in huge. the Valley of the Sun there. And after living down there and everything that goes on, the politics and all that kind of stuff, once I got here in the Ozarks, I knew this is where I'm going to live, die, and be buried. Mm -hmm. So I, I planted my roots and said, "That's it. This is it. This is it. No, no more. Tra I'll travel, <laughs> bluegrass, and but no, this is home." It's just the people. People love them. Yeah. Talk to you and socialize. I mean, I remember the first week I was here, went to Home Depot, was looking for something. In a lot of places, they will say, it's over there. It's over on aisle four, whatever. I had this guy walk me to the thing that I was looking for and ask me, what do you need to fix? Well, I here, this might work better. It's just that kind of people everywhere you go. Uh, it's like, that's why I'm stuck. It's like, yeah, it's, it's just the culture of the people that live here. And it's also, you know, a, a lot to do with the Bible Belt and stuff. Yeah. Something that I found really amazing is, you know, my past time, of, you know, traveling with the country scene and stuff, you couldn't mention God. You couldn't sing about any of that, you know, Jesus and stuff when you're on stage. It was basically forbidden. Coming out here, you're almost begged. At least to have a couple of gospel songs mm -hmm. in every bluegrass set. If we do a set without gospel, people will usually tell us. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh. yes, you guess it was great, but can, can you do a gospel one next set? And we're like, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that, I mean, put, keeping God in everything is very important. You, you, you got to do it, you know. Yeah, Otherwise, this day would be... Band, and that was one of the best. I just love that music. Yeah. So from the heart. Um... So what made you go towards um, bluegrass as opposed to other genres that are here, like old time? Because you guys strongly identify with bluegrass, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is so special about it? It's real. So, mm -hmm. Yes. It's real living, yeah. It... Could you describe for me um, the difference between maybe old time and bluegrass in your own words? I know that's a big question. There's definitely like a lot of, you know, technicality kind of stuff. Definitely. Like, I mean, I know with banjo, um, typically you do a lot more like claw hammer and old time. Mm -hmm. Here's the, um, I, mm -hmm. I cannot remember the name of what you call the style. For, what is it called, Dana? Appalachian. What? No, like a, oh. what the banjo picking style is called. Oh, mm -hmm. I play three finger stroke three -finger style. That's what it is. I could not remember for yeah. the life of me. And the old style claw hammer is more See, of the old timey stuff. Yeah. You have a lot of stuff like that. Typically in old time you don't have a bass. Um, typically guitar yeah. kind of picks up that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, old time is different, you know, depending on who you talk to. Um, typically what we call old time around here is like, you know, the Ozark old time. <laughs> so it's got a, um, typically a lot more instrumental, usually. There's definitely vocal stuff as well. Um, but it's, it's, it kind of grew out of just a need for square dance music as well. Um, so a lot of it's very, um, pretty fast and just something good to dance to. Um, like you, like whenever you, especially there's an old time fiddle song and you're at old time jam, um, one that I absolutely love to go to is McClurg. Um, I, during, whenever, you know, COVID happened, they had a lot of, uh, struggles with that and they kind of moved outside. I think it's going back on now though. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I need to go back there soon, but I went there so many times and, uh, they're fantastic, but those types of jams typically have a song that like, if you play it one time through, it's like 30 seconds, maybe if that, mm -hmm. but you play it like over and over again is, um, everybody's like stomping their feet with it and, uh, just, it's great music to square dance to. Um, but you know, it just, it, there's, there's a lot of, you know, small different things, mm -hmm. but the main one I think is probably the type of instruments, just kind of the style that you're playing in. Yeah. yeah. I think that was a great description. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's all the questions I have for you guys. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss? No, I think we just would say thanks for coming and talking right. with us. Yeah. Yeah. Super yeah, grateful you. for the opportunity. Uh, as Brad mentioned, we've been super blessed and fortunate to get to play many places. Had lots of great people. You know, living in the Ozarks, there are musicians everywhere, and there are super talented people everywhere. So we are super grateful for those people who have given us some time, helped us along the way, and spent a little time with us and invested a bit in us. 
and super proud of the stuff that we've gotten to do. And uh, if you're around anywhere, see that we're going to be playing. Come up and say howdy to us. Stop by the table, visit us. And as I said earlier, keep supporting local musicians. If you see a band in the area playing somewhere, go support them. Go pay the ticket price. Go in and see them. Keep them playing. Keep us playing. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> Just keep those festivals and things alive. Because if we don't, uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, then there won't be any. So keep supporting music. It's fantastic. Pick yeah. long and prosper. <laughs> yes! <laughs> well, the Old Arts has such a rich history of mm -hmm. music. I mean, all the way back, you can go to the front porch picking type stuff that you see. You know, the, the old pictures of the people. I mean, not, I'm not talking about the group, front porch pickers or anything like that. I'm talking about the pictures of those people that would just sit out on their front porch and neighbors would come over and do that. Yeah. Way back in them black and white photos and stuff. And way before Bill Monroe. I mean, this stuff has been going on. You know, there's the Appalachian, you know, folk music and all that kind of stuff. It's been around for coming back to the Scotch Irish a long too. time. A lot where that gets its roots. Yeah, so it's kind of like get out there. I mean, even if you have nothing else to do, <clears throat> go to a couple jams. You'd be amazed how much fun those jams could be and they, yeah. they're they're happening all around. They could be at your churches or in the basement or somebody's house. And how much you learn there is really great too. Like I get asked a lot um, you know, it's like you'll have like just fantastic fiddle players who like they, they can't really here, like, mm -hmm. breaks very well, and coming up with breaks is, and it's something that I, I struggled with a ton, and it's, everybody struggles with it, and it's, like, honestly, the best way to do that is going to jams, because you're, you're just playing a song, and you can practice that, and you start to kind of hear patterns, and you get to try a little, like, licks and fills, and that's honestly the best advice. And I nobody, can, laughs yeah, that. nobody laughs yeah. at you. Nobody laughs at you. Well, she's a banjo player. Most <laughs> yeah, our expectations are low for the banjo players. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, honestly, that's the best thing you can do. So like, if you're, you know, at that place where you're like, I'm, you know, I'm confident what I can play, but I'd like to, you know, kind of maybe know how to play with the band a little bit better, or would like, you know, know how to kind of more improvise a little bit. That's the one of the best things you can do is go to jams. And with singing and harmonizing and all that kind of stuff, it's all there. It, it really is. And then mm -hmm. you can meet other people like Brett mm -hmm. and end up with your own band. You know. Yeah, yeah, we didn't start looking for that. We just came back and looked for jams to go play with the meet people just to have a place to go. Play yeah, I just got the out. bass just to play it. I mean, and had no have expectations time, turned yeah. into. Yeah. I'm going to give a plug, though, because Danny didn't. So talking about traditional stuff and, and Ozarky and stuff, he's playing a John Wynn banjo. Yeah, pick that up and show that so I can see. Lots that. of wind mandolins around, but his uh, banjo was built by Ozarkian okay. legend John, John Wynn Sr. Yeah, that's one that was built about 1980. Show the back so. of that thing. Isn't that pretty? That was the last thing he did for me before he passed away. Was Would you right? mind holding that up a little bit this way, Danny? Oh, thank you. That's, that's the resonator of it. And it's an arch top. That's the original neck. It's walnut, Amer Missouri walnut. This fingerboard is kind of weird because it's, people think it's rosewood, but it's Bacote. Wow. That's what they make ink pens out of. No kidding. John, John was good about that stuff. John could do that. He'd make things differently. So. Um, that's phenomenal. So that's when nice. did you acquire that instrument? I got that instrument in 2009 from a guy in Fairgrove. Uh, he had it for sale. I already had one wind banjo that John had built for me, uh, which I still have, but it's, it's getting a new neck from Eric Sullivan right now. But uh, I bought that in 2009. It had some issues. The, the resonator that was on it didn't belong to it when I got it. It was different finish. It didn't fit. So that's why it's got John got I got a new resonator from it for John. Um, and I just had it worked over and had new frets put on it and really... When it's healthy, it's my number one banjo. Wow, what makes it so special? It's it's got it's got tonal qualities nothing else mm -hmm. has, and and it's and it's also weird too because being an arch top, you can see this right here. Mm -hmm. That's the tone ring configuration of this banjo. There's arch tops and flatheads. Most bluegrass banjos are flatheads, and they create a different tone than an arch top does. I've had other banjo players tell me that this banjo sounds more like a flathead banjo than a flathead banjo does. Wow. But it's got the ability to, to give me different tones and, and just playing it by myself when I can hear all those little nuances and stuff is really what why I love it so much. It's phenomenal. Because I can I can I can do things with that I can't do with other banjos. Um and so you knew John Wynn mm -hmm. for 
close. Very enough. close. He was one of the first people that gave me the chance to play out in front of people. In the Chinese, re playing bluegrass in a Chinese restaurant in Ozark, Missouri. What? <laughs> yep. That's like my kind of show right there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's where I first got to play with somebody in a band, with a banjo. That's amazing. John invited me out. And then over the years, when we were, the last time I played with him in a, it was in a Mexican restaurant in Nixa. So. All the He's left a long legacy. Around. Yeah. So thank you so much for mentioning that. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll make sure to do Italian next time. <laughs> right? <laughs> we'll do all of them. We'll do, yeah. it. We'll do Nikado sometime. We'll work on hey, that. There we go. There go. Right. That's, yeah. I'll be there.
That's a great song. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Um, it's been such a pleasure. And you've given me some great insights into your music and Ozark's music. This has been another edition of Songs of the Ozarks. Thanks, everybody, for watching Appreciate and listening. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.